given the fact that now we are well aware of the distinction between an outlier and an extreme, let's start dealing with extremes. So let's start entering into the realm of extreme value theory and extreme value statistics, okay? Extreme value theory is more the definition that we use from a probabilistic point of view when we deal with extremes just probabilistically. So if you want theoretically, extreme value statistics, uh, which is extremely connected to extreme value theory is the part that deals really with the estimation and the statistical analysis of extremes in data and in models. Okay, uh, what we will do is to focus on extremes. Now, what is an extreme for us? I repeat, it is an event that is rare, so it happens rarely over time or in a cross-sectionally or specially, but in any case, it's rare. So it is not something that we can commonly observe. And it is of big impact. Obviously, uh, big impact is always very relative to the field that we are considering. But for sure, when we speak about risk management and financial risk management, uh, we are speaking about substantial losses. Okay, so losses that are very, very important for our portfolio and our balance sheet. Okay, so we focus on events that have a very small probability of happening, yet if they manifest itself, their impact is extremely important for us. As I told you, most of the times in extreme value theory and extreme value statistics, we focus on the upper tail of the distribution, for sure for us, for the loss distribution. So the top five, the top one, the top 0.1%, and so on. As we shall see, thanks to extreme value theory and statistics, starting from the tail, we can give a lot of details actually about a random variable. So about, for example, a loss random variable. We will use techniques that are most of the time uh, semi parametric, so they combine a parametric component and a non-parametric component. And we will see that actually, in order to get important and sensitive results, we do not need a lot of observations, which is extremely good news for us, because typically when we focus on the very large losses, luckily for us, they, these are not so common in our data. So the fact that we can try to extrapolate and make inference on the tail, just looking at a relatively small number of observations is good news. Now, as we shall see later, but I already like to say something now, when we play with extremes, when we play with tails, and in particular, when we model the so-called fat tails that for us will be all those tails of distributions that enter in the so-called Frechet class, so in the maximum domain of attraction of a Frechet distribution, there are a lot of statistical problems. So first of all, uh, assuming normality when you are playing with a fat tailed random variable is a very, very big and dangerous problem because you can highly underestimate risk, we will see that a lot of results we are used to use, like the CLT, like the law of large numbers in its different declinations, may not work because, for example, a given type of moment is not defined. We will see that under extreme risks, and in particular in the fat tail situation, when we aggregate risks, they tend to explode and diversification becomes very difficult. We will see that there is the problem of historical bias. So a little bit as we stated with the turkeys fallacy, if you remember, we don't have to uh, believe that what we observed in the past is an optimal predictor for what we can expect from the future, because it's quite simple, and I hope also intuitive, to see that the future is necessarily fatter-tailed than the past. 
In sports, the new record is never in the data. It's a new record. So why should we ignore this from a financial point of view? The new big loss is never in our data. So our data for us just provide a sort of lower bound. So the maximum so far is a sort of lower bound for the new big maximum that will represent a record. So historical bias is an extremely important problem. Do not over rely too much on the past because otherwise it's like driving a car, just looking at the rear mirror and not looking in front of you. So you just look at what happens behind you. And if you're lucky, you can try to drive, drive a few meters, but then sooner or later you will crash. And finally, we will also consider the, the fact that when you have a very erratic phenomenon uh, that can generate very large variations and deviations, then cherry picking, that is to say, finding the observations that justify your theory, is extremely uh, easy, yet a problem, because then if you convince yourself that your theory is correct when your theory is wrong, I don't know how clever it is. Now, Let's see why we need extreme value theory as a branch of statistics, and we cannot just rely on the results that we already know. Now, let x1, x2, x3, and so on be IID random variables. So IID means independently and identically distributed random variables. Now, we know that we can always define the quantity Sn for a given n to be the so-called partial sum, okay? Now, what do we know about the limiting behavior of this partial sum when n tends and grows to infinity? So if we have a sample and we start observing the different observations and we start summing these observations and then the number of observations grows to infinity, what do we know about this sum? Now, I'm pretty sure that you already know the, the answer. So we can rely on the so-called CLT, the central limit theorem. In fact, the quantity Sn, the partial sum, if properly normalized by removing essentially the mean and dividing by the standard deviation, will converge to a normally distributed random variable, a standard normally distributed random variable. This obviously in the case in which the variance is finite, so that the standard deviation is finite. Otherwise, we can uh, generalize the results, so we can consider the generalized CLT, the generalized central limit theorem, in which we do not impose anything about the variance being finite or not, and then the convergence will be towards a stable distribution. Now, you understand that if we have these partial sums and we can properly normalize in them, convert towards a standard normal, then immediately it should be clear why the normal distribution is such an important distribution in statistics. So it's a distribution that comes out from very important results as the, the CLT. And it is extremely useful because imagine of all the, the many applications of the normal distribution, if we have that something is asymptotically normal, then we can use, for example, this asymptotic result to build, if the number of observations is large enough, uh, confidence intervals that inherit the properties of the normally distributed random variable. Uh, that is, for example, what we do in statistics when we use the properties of the maximum likelihood estimator. So we always know that there is this convergence to a normally distributed random variable, and this is a very useful and important fact because then we can use the properties of the normal distribution. On your screen, you see the density. Nothing particularly uh, important. I know that you exactly know this density by heart. When 
I repeat, the normal distribution is not the limit. For example, when our IAD observations don't have a finite variance, then we still have for the partial sums, the generalized CLT that tells us that convergence is with, with respect to a stable distribution, which is another very useful distribution that generalizes, if you want, the, the normal case. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that, unfortunately, when we play with extremes, and as I told you, extremes for us are maxima and minima, okay, for maxima and minima, the convergence to the normal distribution does not work. So we cannot treat a maximum or a minimum as a partial sum. So we cannot rely on a CLT. This comes from the fact that extremes, so maxima and minima, do not live in a so-called Gaussian world, as for example, means. If you consider uh, a maximum, the limit in distribution of your maximum will not be a normal. So unfortunately, we cannot play with that distribution. We need to introduce new tools, new distributions. But the question that we can ask ourselves is, is there a way of defining a sort of CLT in quotation marks? Okay, so it's not the CLT. We want to define a sort of CLT for extremes. Good for us, the answer is yes. There are theorems uh, we can rely upon that uh, give us conditions for the limiting behavior of extremes under a certain number, obviously, of assumptions. And uh, some of these results were developed, for example, by very important Dutch mathematicians like uh, Lawrence de Haan and uh, Hus Balkma. Uh, one of the theorems that we will consider is, for example, the uh, Pekins Balkma de Haan theorem. And why do I underline this? Because, okay, we are in the Netherlands and the Netherlands uh, have used a lot extreme value theory to take care of an important problem, that is to say the sea level. You know that the Netherlands are under the sea level for a great, a great deal of its territory. So building dams and dikes strong enough, high enough to protect the population, especially after the Second World War, was an important task of the Dutch government. And they also gave birth to a project called the Delta Project to build these protections from the sea. And extreme value theory had a very strong input and a very strong growth under the Delta Project. And people like the scholars I just cited were involved in that. So, Extreme value theory is an extremely useful field of statistics, not only for us from a financial point of view, but knowing how to play with maxima it is, is very important. Because if you want to build a dam, if you want to build a protection against the sea level, you're not interested in the average sea level. But you want to be safe when the sea level grows very quickly because of a storm, because of a earthquake because of many different reasons, okay? So this is what we will do with extreme value theory. Now, we will see that essentially the role of the normal distribution or of the stable distribution, more general terms, within EVT is played by two different distributions. We will give more details later, but I like already to name these distributions. The first one, the GED, is the generalized extreme value distribution. The second one, the GTD, is the generalized Pareto distribution. Now, these two distributions are distributions that we obtain from important theorems. The GED comes out of the very famous fischer tippett theorem, the GTD from the Pekins Balkma, the Hahn theorem. Those, these, those two distributions are actually connected 
we will see how. And also from a practical point of view, we will see that they are the result not only of different theorems, but also of statistical approaches that we can use to study maxima. One approach is BM, the block maxima approach that leads uh, towards a GED, a generalized extreme value distribution. The second approach is the POT, the peaks over threshold, which is conversely linked uh, to the GPD, the generalized Pareto distribution. Again, I repeat, in the limit, we will see that the results that you get in one situation or the other are essentially the same. It's just different the perspective that we are using. Both methods, both the block maxima and the POT, so the peaks of the threshold, are meant to define the maxima that we want to, to model. But we will be back with more details. Now, the first thing that we have to do in order to be rigorous into the treatment of extreme value theory is to define what is a maximum for us. Now, mimicking the concept of partial sum, so the quantity Sn that we have just considered, we can introduce the so-called partial maximum. So I still consider a sequence of x1, x2, x3, iad random variables. I defined m1 to be equal to x1, so the first observation, if you have a data set that contains one observation, that observation corresponds to the minimum, to the maximum, to the mean, to the median, to everything, okay? So if I set m1 equal to x1, then for all the other n's, so for n being larger than one, I define mn to be the maximum value among the first n observations, okay? So m3, is nothing more than the maximum value among the first three observations, and 10 among the first 10 observations. What you can see is that necessarily until I do not observe a new record, so a new big maximum larger than those I observed before, M1, M2, M3 can actually share the the same value because I'm always taking the maximum. So if I have a sequence which is one, one, two, one, obviously the maximum is two. And if I continue my sequence like one, one, two, one, 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 the maximum keeps on being two until I find, for example, a five, a three, a four, or any other value larger than two, okay? So we call M1, M2, M3, and so on, the so-called partial maxima. Now, as I told you in this course, and most of the times if you take a book on extreme value theory, like the beautiful book by uh, the Hahn and Ferreira, or if you take the book by Embrex, Mikosh, and Kluppelberg, so if you take those books, most of the times all the modeling is on the maxima and not on the minima. Now, for us, this is natural because we want to model losses and for us, losses are positive quantities. So the maximum loss is what we care uh, for. Uh, but if, assume that I want to model minima. Now it is just trivial to observe that if I have a sample x1, x2, x3, xn, uh, if I take the minimum of this sample, this minimum is equal to minus the maximum of all the values in the sample in which I change the sign. Okay, so the, the minimum of x1, xn is equal to minus the maximum of minus x1, minus xn. Okay, so all the results that I can get for the maximum are easily translated into results for the minima, thanks to this very simple transformation that you see on your screen. Okay, now, once I have my partial maxima. The question is, mimicking what we did with the partial sums, is there a way of getting a limiting behavior for this partial maxima? And even more, is there a way of finding constants, sequences of constants, an and bn, such that I can 
rescale my partial maxima and get a limiting behavior. So is there a way of finding something that plays the role of the mean in the CLT and something that plays the role of the standard deviation in the CLT? These are BN and AN. And being able to standardize my maxima so that I can have a limiting behavior. Why? are we asking if we can standardize? Because if we do not standardize, so if we do not standardize, for sure, a sort of CLT for the maxima is immediately ruled out. Why that? Because it's very simple to observe the following. Define XF to be the so-called right end point of our distribution. So we are assuming that all our Xs follow a distribution f of x, okay? Now, the right-hand point of the distribution f of x, what we call x f, is nothing more than the supremum such that the distribution f of x is smaller than one. Now, it is not difficult to see that this x f, the right-hand point, can be finite or not, depending on the support of the distribution. Now, what is important is that if we do not normalize, if we do not standardize the partial maxima, then if I consider the probability of mn, which is the partial maximum, being smaller than or equal to a given value x, so if I consider the distribution function of my partial maximum, and then I take n growing to infinity, now, this probability here will necessarily go to zero or one. And it will go to zero or one depending on the value small x that you see on your screen. If small x is smaller than xf, so it's smaller than the right hand point, the probability will converge to zero. If conversely, x is larger than xf, it will go to one. I leave the proof of this very simple result to you, but it's just a matter of writing down explicitly what the probability of mn being smaller than or equal to x is in terms of the CDF of uh, x. Okay, so we know that would be fx to the power n, and then make all your speculations. And you will see that if we do not normalize, we will have necessarily a degenerate result. So we either go to zero or we go to one, which is not very useful for statistical analysis. Okay, so it's actually useless. So we have to normalize. Now the answer are the two theorems that I already uh, cited before, the Fischer-Tippett. The Fischer-Tippett theorem is the theorem that leads to the GV, the generalized Exxon value distribution, which is a limiting distribution for the normalized uh, partial maxima, okay? So we can find sequences of BN and AN such that MN minus BN over AN converges towards a GV that we will define in the next lesson. Uh, the other theorem is the, the, uh, the piquant's bulk mother Han that conversely leads towards uh, GPD. In that case, uh, the maximum is defined in another way. So we are not immediately looking at the normalized maximum, but we will look at the so-called exceedance. But again, we will give more details later. What I want you to understand is that in EBT, the limiting behavior played by the normal or the stable distribution in the standard CLT can be played by these two distributions that actually are not distribution, but more families of distributions. Because we will see that depending on the value of the parameters, and in particular, the so-called tail parameter that will be psi or alpha, depending on the formalization of the distribution, then 
uh, we might have different limiting cases. We will see, for example, that the GED is a family of distributions because depending on the value of the psi parameter, we get the so-called Frechet case, the so-called Gumbel case, or the so-called the Bible case that are limiting distributions. And knowing explicitly this limit is extremely important because it gives us a huge amount of information about the phenomenon that we are studying. Okay, let's uh, consider now the framework of the Fisher-Tippett theorem. So we want to arrive to the Fisher-Tippett theorem. Uh, what we can define is the concept of max stable distribution. Now we want to find some non-degenerate limit laws for the maxima when these are properly formalized. In, another, in other words, we want to find uh, essentially distributions that satisfy the following connection. That is to say, if I consider the maximum of x1, xn in distribution, this is equal to a rescaling of x. So a n x plus b n. If this is the case, we say that the distribution that we are considering is a max stable distribution. So in a sense, this is a concept close to the closure under convolution that we are used to use in standard statistics. Max stability is nothing more than a property of closure under maximization. It means that if I have a random variable, and I look at the maximum of this random variable, the maximum will have a distribution which is actually a rescaling of the distribution of the starting random variable. This is the closure under uh, maximization. Uh, we will see that closure under maximization is a very important concept in the fischer tippett theorem. Okay, I would like to close this lesson with an important result that goes under the name of Poisson approximation. This result is behind some other results that we will say uh, together later. Now the proposition is what you can read on your screen. We have a given tau that can be between zero and plus infinity with plus infinity included in the possible values of this tau. And we consider a sequence UN of real numbers. Then we consider our CDF of our sequence of random variable. And with F bar, we identify the survival function, okay? So uh, F of X is the probability of my random variable being smaller than or equal to X. F bar is the probability of being above. So it's one minus F of X. This is a standard way of identifying the survival function. Sometimes the survival function, for example, in survival analysis, is known as S of X, but here, since S is already the partial sum, we use the more common way of identifying the survival function with F bar, okay? So the proposition states that the two equations, one and two, are equivalent. So N, F bar, UN tends to tau, is essentially equivalent to say that the probability that the partial maximum mn is smaller than or equal to un converges to the exponential of minus tau. Okay, proving this Poisson approximation is not difficult. We will do that, I will do that for you only for the case tau being finite. So, I just leave out the case tau equal to infinity. I leave that to you as an optional exercise in the sense that I will not ask for these results in, in the exam, but nevertheless, it's very useful. So try to solve the exercise in, in any case. The case in which tau is finite is extremely simple. So let's, for example, assume that the first equation, equation one holds then we can immediately write that the probability of mn being smaller than or equal to un, which is nothing more than the CDFF evaluated in un to the power n because of the IAD hypothesis that we are making. And obviously, this can be 
rewritten by substituting the fact that f is equal to one minus one minus f, which is a bar, so we can substitute that. And then we can just assume that one holds, as we did, we can just substitute the result for one, and we essentially get this result that implies two because of the representation of the exponential uh, function. If conversely, we assume that the second equation holds, then we have that f bar of un tend to zero. It has to tend to zero because otherwise something tricky happens. And my question is for you is what? What does it happen? So that is my question for you to make a little bit the lesson more interesting and not just passive learning. So, uh, but if this is true, so if equation two is true, then we can take blocks and immediately we can write that minus n, uh, the log of one minus f bar of u n tends to tau. So this is just a rewriting of equation two in the log. But we know that if the quantity x tends to zero and we consider minus the log of one minus x, this is more or less x. So it means that if, since I know that my f bar u n tends to zero, if I substitute that, it means that minus n, the log of one minus f bar u n is more or less f bar of u n. Now, I can uh, just, substitute that there, and what I get is essentially the first uh, equation as a result. So we see that the two equations are equivalent, and that will prove very useful for us in some of the results that we will see in the next classes.